From the Preservation Maryland studios in the historic podcast district of Baltimore, this is PreserveCast. John Brown. Few names in American history inspire as much controversy, admiration, and consternation. He was a controversial figure in his own time, and he remains so today. But no matter your opinion, Brown's legacy is critically important and must be explored and remembered. Today's guest, Martha Swan, is the founder and executive director of John Brown Lives, an organization dedicated to preserving Brown's farm in upstate New York and using his legacy to inspire future generations. On this week's Preserve Cast, we're talking about John Brown, memory, and how to use the past to engage the present. Hey, it's Nick here, and a quick thank you for all your support. And if you enjoy this podcast, I hope you'll please consider making a donation at PreserveCast.org. We produce this podcast on a shoestring budget, and even $5 will go a long way. I also want to thank the 1772 Foundation for their continued support. Also, if you haven't left us a five-star review, please do that. It really helps. Now, let's head back to the 19th century to talk John Brown. This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, and today we're excited to be joined by Martha Swan, who is both the founder and executive director of John Brown Lives, a freedom education and human rights organization, and the official New York State Friends Group of the John Brown Farm State Historic Site in Lake Placid, uh, in my home state of New York. And we're so excited to have Martha with us, with us today to talk about um, not only the work that they're doing in, in this pivotal um person in American history, but but how that work can inform the present. Um, and so, um, like we ask of all of our uh, preserve cast uh, guests, um, what put you on the path um, to founding and leading a group like John Brown Lives? You know, where did you grow up and were you interested in history? How did you end up doing this uh, important work? Well, hi, Nicholas. It's really a pleasure to have this chance to talk to you and um, and your listeners, I guess. Um, I grew up in Syracuse, New York, uh, in a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood, um, and I lived there until I went away to college to uh, one of the state universities in New York. Um, I wasn't much interested in history. I didn't know anything about history. I didn't get any get it about history at all. It really wasn't until I was well into my college years, you know, late teens, early 20s, um, when I started to see that there was a, a deep and, and um, abiding connection between social justice issues and human rights issues I was becoming aware of and interested in in college, um, that there was a historical connection and a historical antecedent that really, in in the, the issues that I was looking at at the time, that really... Um, went far to explaining what current conditions were. Um, I was a Spanish and education major in, in college and undergrad and was pl planning to become a teacher. Um, so all things Spanish and Spanish speaking world at that time, and this is in the late seventies, early eighties, really, um, I think laid the seedbed for the work that I've been able, fortunate to do around John Brown and abolition and, and history in this regard. Well, and that that's probably a perfect segue since you 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 mentioned the big guy here, um, and the organization is called John Brown Lives. But you know, we have listeners all, all across the the world. I think I was telling you before we got recording that we just interviewed somebody from England. And so, if someone is is listening across the globe, or perhaps they're even listening here in the United States, and they're they're not familiar with John Brown, can you give us a thumbnail biography? Who was he? When did he live? And I suppose most importantly, why is he still significant today? Well, that's such an important and fundamental question because someone who was so pivotal in our history um, that people people ask who, <laughs> you know, they don't know who John Brown is. Um, and I didn't either until quite recently, you know, well into my adulthood. John Brown was a is is was a white man born in 1800, um, and at a very young into a you know principled abolitionist family, and at a very young age, uh, he was born in the north. He witnessed a young uh, boy, black child about his age, being severely beaten by his master overseer, and I you know Brown talked about that later in his life as a seminal moment where where he became convicted of uh, his commitment to 
to be involved in that slavery was just an egregious wrong and that he would he would dedicate his life you know that was his sort of coming of age moment um in dealing and reckoning with the original sin of the United States. And so he, you know, he became more and more, more and more committed. He was active in the Underground Railroad. He was active in helping set up vigilante, uh, vigilance committees. Um, And as the country was deepening its commitment to the enslavement of black people, um, And as the wars were spreading in Kansas, the fight over whether to keep Kansas for Kansas to enter the the country as a slave state or as a free state, John Brown joined his sons in Kansas in the bloody wars in Kansas to try to help ensure that um, Kansas entered the country as a free state and not as a slave state. And I think it's really important to, to note um, and to appreciate that the country, the nation, um, in many ways was redoubling its commitment to slavery and the, the you know, with the desire to expand territory, um, with the um, free, fugitive slave laws, um, the, the peril and the outrageousness of slavery in John Brown's eyes, um, was it required more deeper commitment, more action. And so that led him to um, organize a small band of, of young men, mostly, um, a few of his sons and a number of other young men, both black and white, to uh, seize an arsenal, a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And in that exercise, in that, in that action, um, the, his intention as the historians I've read and deeply respect writing on this issue, Lou DeCaro being uh, chief among them, um, his plan really was to try to retreat to the mountains and create these um, communities of freed people and allies who would, over time, be developing this chain of of um, encampments almost um, and be striking fear in the economic heart of, of slavery and that that would be a, that would be a means for um, the eventual elimination of slavery. He was captured at Harper's Ferry um, and held on trial. And it was his trial really. And the, the attention around the trial, um, the media attention interviews with him and so forth, which really uh, I think catapulted him, him to a, to a fame um, at the time that he wouldn't have had, maybe not would have had otherwise. Um, so he was he was tried, uh, convicted of treason, of citing a, a riot, I think, I can't remember the exact terms, um, and was hanged in December of 1859. Um, by that time, you know, he had had, I mean, a man of his stature, of his conviction and commitment, um, although he's often been portrayed as this you know, really maniacal, homicidal, crazy man. Um, he had the he had alliances um, and the confidence of many very prominent black and white um, Americans at the time. So, someone who whose commitment to slave to ending slavery and to and as it turned out to give his life. Um, and the lives of his sons um, to to ending slavery in our country, um, it really set him apart from from his peers. Yeah, and I and I think that I mean that's a that's a good place to kind of I mean we can we're going to talk a little bit more about about John Brown and and his actions and um, what they what they mean today, um, which I think is important. And and I was I also was telling you before we. We hit record that I'm I'm recording not far right now from from Harper's Ferry, where in, in 1859, as you say, he makes that raid on slavery and and is uh, convicted of treason, and and then in doing so, sort of becomes this this martyr for the cause and and one of the um, the principal uh, I guess actors or events in that that caused the Civil War, and so one way or the other, um, you know, I guess he said what it was it can't be purged away but with blood. Um, he brings about. Uh, the cataclysmically bloody civil war, um, a terribly significant person. And we're talking to you in upstate New York because 
Um, among other things, John Brown lives. Your organization works to preserve and interpret th- his home. Um, what? So I'm curious. You know, I've actually never been there. Um, I've been to a lot of um, uh, interesting John Brown sites, but I've never been to uh, Brown's home. So what's it like? Where is it located? Um, and you know, paint a picture for people who haven't been there. Um, what is the area and the region like? And and I suppose what's the state of preservation of the site itself? Well, it's it's a beautiful site. Um, it's really located in the heart of the Adirondack Mountains, um, on the edge of the village of Lake Placid, which mo- most people are probably familiar with because of its Olympic history. Um, but the farm itself, um, it's been in the, the hands of New York State since the late 1800s, um, coming up on the 125th anniversary, I think, next year of it being entrusted in the hands of the state. And it's a 270-acre site with wild, wildflower meadows, with woodlands, with with um, trails, and with the historic house, the grave site. Um, there are a number of other monuments um, and a couple of other buildings that aren't part of the, the footprint um, of when John John and Mary Brown live there with their children. But it, it really, it has a quality um, for many people who visit of feeling like a time-honored place, um, a sacred site, um, a, a place of, of contemplation, reflection, sanctuary, if you will. And I think that's in part because of what John Brown lived and died for, but also because of the site itself. It's very rare, um, I think particularly in the Northeast, that a historic site is so expansive in, in acreage. So it's quite lovely, quite beautiful. And in in terms of the actual structure itself, what is the what was John Brown's home like? Is it is it still there? Is it still um, very similar to the way it looked? Um, what, how, how, how big is it? Kind of maybe give people a sense for the actual home site itself. Oh, it's a very modest, a very modest wood, you know, clappered house. Um, two rooms on the ground floor. One was a kitchen with a bed in the corner and the other was more of the parlor. And upstairs, it's just one open raw, um, the wood, you know, the wood paneling, wood beams showing, what have you. Very, very, very humble. Um and what's more, you know, there's nothing ornate about it. And that, and that would be not only in keeping with, you know, John Brown's aesthetic and his, his ethic, but also he was pretty impoverished a good part of his life. Um, and he wasn't interested in, in his own material wealth or in some ways, I suppose, his own well-being other than his, his I think, what he might have regarded as his, his spiritual well-being. Um, so it's very modest. I, I want to tell you a little bit and your listeners about what brought him there to begin with, because that gets lost often. And that's a very important um, sort of recentering story when we look at John Brown in New York State and John Brown in this region. Um, and that really is a voting rights story that dates back to 1846. Um, as your listeners probably know, uh, New York was a slave state and slavery wasn't fully um, phased out or abolished until the late 1820s. Um, <clears throat> and there was a lot of agitation and organizing and petitioning on the part really of uh, leading black reformers in New York State to also gain the franchise and to have equal political rights, um, which was a, a really tough slog. And in 1846, the voters in New York, which at the time were white men, were being um, given the opportunity to vote in a referendum as to whether black men, free black men in New York, would have to pay $250 in property in order to vote or whether that property requirement would be eliminated. It had been eliminated for white men. So in the summer of that year, the spring, summer of 46, 1846, um, Garrett Smith, who was a white abolitionist, reformer, philanthropist, radical philanthropist in upstate New York in Peterborough, in, in conversation with these black allies and reformers and leaders who were really leading the way on the vote, the importance of the vote, 
Garrett Smith had amassed um, from his father and other investments and so forth, vast amounts of land in New York State. Um, and he said, if land they must have, land they will have. And he gave away 120,000 acres of Adirondack land to 3,000 free black men in order that they might approximate that requirement that land or property requirement and also he was a he was an um what's the word um agrarianist someone who believed deeply in the work on the land and that if uh, if a man probably a man at the time wanted land to farm that he should have land to farm um and so giving away these 40 acre lots to black new yorkers it was also an opportunity for um you know some economic um, uplift to self-sufficiency for, for black New Yorkers to gain a foothold on the land themselves. So of those 3,000 individuals, only a few dozen ever made the move from Troy, from New York City, from Syracuse, from wherever, to the hinterlands, I mean, the deep, thick wilderness of the Adirondacks in 1846. And the vote was in November, so I'm really, the, the onset of winter is coming. So, you know, the people who, who said, yeah, I think I'll hitch my wagon and move to the Adirondacks were, understandably, you know, pretty few and far between. But it was, it was those Black pioneers. It was those black settlers, um, homesteaders, who, whose decision to live on this landscape and to try their hand at the farming and clearing the woods and building their home and so forth, um, inspired John Brown to come and be, uh, I think, as he put it, a kind of neighbor. And he might have even, you know, he could have been a little... Um, patriarchal, you know, to be a father and a, a neighbor to them. I mean, he was a, he, he, he knew how to farm, he knew how to live on the land, how to clear the land, how to raise sheep and so forth. So he, he definitely had skills that would be of use to, to settlers who were coming from the city. So that's what brought him to be a neighbor and a friend and a help. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting story. I was actually going to follow up and ask you, um, after you kind of told us about the place, how he ended up in Lake Placid, which even today, uh, you know, the Adirondacks are can be a wild and sort of wilderness place, which is what's beautiful about them. And I imagine in the 1840s, it was it was even even more so. Why don't we take a quick break here, and then when we come back, let's talk about the programming that your organization is doing today around John Brown. And we'll do that right here on Preserve Cast. 100 years ago in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States was signed into law and officially granted 20 million American women the right to vote. This mass expansion in voting rights was the result of generations of intense activism known as the women's suffrage movement that has had a lasting legacy on the continued fight for equality in America. In recognition of the struggles and achievements of a once disenfranchised majority, PreserveCast is honored to share remarkable stories of suffragists within each episode this year. Beyond the Ballot is supported by Preservation Maryland, Gallagher, Avilius, and Jones Attorneys at Law, and the Maryland Historical Trust. To learn more about influential women, past and present, or to donate, please visit BallotAndBeyond.org. This week on Ballot and Beyond... We'll learn about legendary abolitionists and suffragists Frederick Douglass and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, read by Shante Daniels, Executive Director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Abolitionists to Suffragists Frederick Douglass, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper Women played an active role in advocating for an end to slavery, but faced gender discrimination from their abolitionist peers as well as the general public, who felt women were taking too vocal a public role. Many white abolitionist women began to draw comparisons between the nation's treatment of enslaved persons and the legal discrimination against women. Frustrated by the sexist treatment by fellow abolitionists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott convened the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in July 1848. The convention drew 300 men and women who collaborated to produce a declaration of sentiment that was modeled on the Declaration of Independence. The declaration proclaimed 
the equal rights of women and men and detail the many abuses facing American women. A key figure in drafting of the Declaration was nationally known abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who had been born into slavery on Maryland's eastern shore. Douglass was a critical ally for Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her bold decision to propose a resolution calling for women's enfranchisement. Frederick Douglass was the lone man in the attendance who supported the resolution. This important moment marked the beginning of a fragile, racially mixed coalition of men and women who sought expanded rights for all people, including the right to vote. In 1866, Douglas, Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony formed the American Equal Rights Association, AERA, to secure equal rights for all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex. The more inclusive organizations had the support of African American activists like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper a published poet and author who had been born free in Baltimore in 1825 and campaigned around the country for temperance, abolition, and women's rights in an attempt to create social unity after the American Civil War. The AER members, like Harper, believed it was the right time to integrate gender, race, and class-based advocacy in a broad push for equality. With the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870 that granted the vote to black men but not to women, an integrated and holistic approach for equality would never coalesce. In fact, many suffragists opposed the 15th Amendment, refusing to accept that black men would have the right to vote before white women. The unification that Douglas and Harper sought would not happen and racial tensions would echo throughout the remainder of the women's suffrage movement and often dictated a separate course for white and black suffragists. As the segregated movement proceeded, Watkins Harper would found the American Women's Suffrage Association and served as vice president of the National Association of Colored Women, among many other civic and literary achievements. Watkins Harper died nine years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Her spiritual approach and her activism rings clear in her poem, Songs for the People. Songs for the People. Let me make the song for the people. Songs for the old and young. Songs to stir like a battle cry whenever they are sung. Not for the clashing of sabers, for the carnage nor for strife, but for the songs to thrill the heart of men with more abundant life. Let me make the song for the weary amid life's fever and fret till heart shall relax their tension and careworn brows forget. Let me sing for little children before their footsteps stray, sweet anthems of love and duty to afloat over life's highway. I would sing for the poor and aged when shadows dim their sight of the bright and restful mansions where there shall be no night. Our world so worn and weary needs music pure and strong to hush the jangle and discords of sorrow, pain, and wrong. Music to soothe its sorrow till war and crime shall cease and the hearts of men grown tender girdle the world with peace. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to Preserve Cast again. We're joined by Martha Swan, who is the founder and the executive director of John Brown Lives. We've been talking all about who John Brown was. Uh, John Brown the man, John Brown the legend, the myth, uh, and the martyr, whatever you want to call him. He he filled many roles in the 19th century. Um, and um, to this day, um, groups um, like John Brown Lives are 
uh, working to use his story to sort of inform the present. And so I'm curious, talk to us about the programming that you do, because you're not just a traditional friends group. Um, you're also focused on bringing Brown's story you know, to life and, and forward to inspire current and future generations. And, and I'm curious, along with that programming, how do you handle sort of the controversial nature of Brown? Because you met, you, you know, you touched on Kansas and some people would say Brown was a freedom, freedom fighter. And some would say he, he killed people in cold blood. Um, and so how do you, how do you balance that? Cause I, I think we're all, you know, we're, we're all curious how we tell these difficult stories and tell this full history. Okay, so we, we just left off talking about what brought John Brown here. And to help tell that story, because it seems so very vitally important um, to, to, for, for visitors, for, for people to understand, oh, he came here to be an ally, a friend, a neighbor of black settlers who preceded him here. And it was part of this ongoing voting rights struggle for black New Yorkers. And so we mounted an exhibition called Dreaming of Timbuktu, which is installed permanently at the site. And it also we also have a, a, a traveling duplicate, which right now is at, actually on the campus of SUNY Albany. And I mean, that's relevant today, given the, the, the issues the difficulties, the the roadblocks um, that people of color in particular have are experiencing now, have experienced in the last, you know, number of years and the last couple of days, you know, trying to cast a free and un, their free and unfettered vote and and fully enjoy the franchise like they're white Americans. So so getting that story out and helping people to see that this is this this struggle for voting rights has a very long a very long history and and obviously an unfinished one so that's a lesson those are lessons in there that we can learn from in dialogue that we can have around this around this um fundamental right for some right so so that's an exhibit then we also have inspired by that exhibit and as an effort to try to attract people to the farm who might not come otherwise we um have had a blues we call it blues at timbuktu concert um this is this year would be our fifth we're doing it virtually this year so i'll send you the info so you can get it out to people um and one of the reasons i mean aside from drawing audiences to the farm who might not otherwise come um, because they're not interested in history or maybe, you know, getting to some of the squeamishness that people have around Brown, like, ooh, we don't want to go there, uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, we've, we've staged this concert every year. And for me, one of the other reasons that I'm really interested in this concert is because through the music and through the blues, we can also acknowledge, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a stretch, but it's a loose connection sort of turned toward, I mean, the, the origin of the blues is in Western Africa, right? And Mali, Timbuktu Mali was this grand, extraordinary place of learning and commerce and, and um, Islam and religious tolerance and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a soft, how do I want to put it? It's like opening a portal for someone to walk through to find out more and to see, oh, what a surprising connection. So that's one of the ways we work. Um, we have um, uh, this summer, we were very honored to be able to install um, something called the Memorial Field for Black Lives, which was created by a local artist and designer, Karen Davidson Seward. Um, and this was a series of, of marker, markers, almost like a headstone marker, um, that she was inspired originally um, to, to create, to say something after um, Ahmed Arbery was killed back in the spring. Um, and she created this one very succinct marker um, as a kind of testimony to what, you know, who he was and, and how brutally he had been killed. And given what the country has been, particularly with Black America, the, the violence that they've been subjected to in these last couple of months at the hands of the police and, and you know, some white vigilantes, um, she was moved to create more and then looking into the history of, of 
police violence against black black people you know there's a there's a very very long history so she ended up creating now what's a 50 uh, marker memorial field so we've had that installed at the farm all summer we just took it down the other night because we had 12 inches of snow up there this week <laughs> um and that was an opportunity for you know the, the public to sort of walk through this an arlington an arlington or normandy style memorial field if you will and just if they're able and willing you know to just quietly take in what this violence and this anti-black animus is that's still that's still I hate to say it, but flourishes in many ways in our country. I, I, I it's, it's, a, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's a painful point, but it is a point. You know, I was going to ask you about, and we can do this now, and then maybe come back to the controversial side of Brown and how you, how you grapple with that, because I mean, you know, you, you mentioned violence, and I feel like violence is a thread that runs through a lot of 19th century America, um, and 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 I guess 21st century America for that matter, um, but. You know, we are we are living through a moment. I mean, there's been many moments, but but particularly kind of given a name through the Black Lives Matter movement um, and an opportunity to sort of expand awareness uh, around the full history of American history, at least the stuff that we deal with here on this podcast, and making sure that everyone can see themselves reflected in history and preservation and sites. Um, and that that's a that's a critical component of the work that we do. And it seems like um, Brown is a great story and a great person to kind of use that for. And I'm curious, I mean, this is kind of, you know, I guess an opinion thing, but where would Brown be in, in, to, in, in this story today? And is, is Black Lives Matter the right place? And it sounds like it is given that you've, you know, done an entire exhibit there, but, um, you know, I guess does, is, is Brown an important person to think about when we start talking about Black Lives Matter and how, um, white Americans can be a part of that, or maybe as kind of component of that, given the controversial side of Brown, is is that a dangerous road to go down? Did he go too far? And I guess there's no right answer to this, but I'm just curious, given that you spend a lot of time thinking about these things and about a guy like John Brown, who I, I personally think is very interesting. Um, I'm curious what you think about all that and, and, and how this all comes together in a moment like this. Well... One thing I'll say is that um, black lives have always mattered at the John Brown farm. They've always mattered to John Brown and they've always mattered at the John Brown farm. And that can be seen in a number of different ways. One, that he moved there to be ally, neighbor, friend of these black settlers. And his home, he was known for treating black men and women and children with the same respect, honoring their dignity as human beings as he would anybody else. So he was, he, he was, he distinguished himself. I think he and his family distinguished themselves, even among other white abolitionists who weren't necessarily anti-racist. Um, and that, you know, there at the site, um, at the grave site, which is quite an, um, a very, what do I want to say about the grave site? It has such a, a gravitas um, and the remains of a number of the, the raiders, including I think two of the black raiders are buried there. They're interred there with the, where John's brought, was interred, where his, where his sons were interred, where his grandfather, his grandfather's, I think it was his grandfather, um, his, his remains were also interred there. So it's a place of honoring of black lives. Um, how, where he would fit today. I mean, I think that, you know, John Brown, he, he, he knew violence when he saw it. And for John Brown, slavery was extraordinary violence. It was a state of war against black people. And I think that he wouldn't have very much confusion today about what, what violence is, right? Um, and who perpetrates it. He, he said something, um, it was his last address to the court before he was executed. And he said, it goes like this, and I'm, I'm shortening it a little, but this is the gist. Had I so interfered on behalf of the rich, the powerful, the so-called great, it would have been all right. 
And everybody in this room would indeed deemed it an act worthy of praise, right? And so he understood deeply the contradictions and the hypocrisy of the United States. He, he viewed slavery as an ongoing, perpetual, relentless act of war. And I think that where he is maybe most important now in this moment is that he he knew that slavery was something that white America had to reckon with, could not sit on the sidelines about, had to get involved, had to commit to, and and in his case, give his life to to end. So I th- I think that's useful, and I I think so when we when we talk about his very selective use of violence, I think his his use of violence was was tactical. It was very rare, very rare, and I think tactical. And, and you mentioned Kansas. And I think, you know, most historians would say that Kansas was, it wasn't called bloody Kansas for no reason, right? The the horrendous violence against um, the free state people who were moving in, settling, trying to ensure that it came into the country as a, as a free state. Um, it was horrific, bloody violence. Um, and I don't condone... And, you know, it's so interesting when, when, you know, when we think about how, how little known he is um, as such a pivotal figure in our history, um, I think that he presents, he holds a mirror up to us as a people and up to us as a country. And I really think that if we if we look long and hard we can he's asking us what is violence when one person or one entity chooses vi- why do we why do we call some things violence and some things not that's that's what i'm trying to get at right and and i also think when i first started to learn about john brown i mean i was in my 30s for crying out loud <laughs> and i was i was i was indignant that I was in my well into my thirties before I had any information at all, and I, as I, I, I don't know if I told you before, but I wasn't interested in history particularly, right? So to be in my thirties when I'm learning about a white man who gave his life to ending slavery, and and even though I don't ever remember consciously learning anything about him, I had in my mind. My mind, my image of him was that, you know, that Kansas mural, that that maniacal homicidal guy going around killing white people. I had that I had that image. And when I it was at Harper's Ferry, actually, you know, the ranger there standing in store college, the way he spoke about John Brown and the newly freed people and uh, the Niagara movement and the things that happened there. I it was this incredible awakening and part of it made me just furious it's like why why are we not taught about this man in all of his complexities and it made me again it's like another question to hold up and ask ourselves huh why is that that we're we have not been steeped in learning about a white ally and accomplice right in the struggle to end slavery and to bring about equal equality, freedom, and human rights for black people in this country. Yeah. It's a, it's a critically important story. And, um, you know, it's one that's uh, perhaps because we're close to Harper's Ferry is one that we hear about here, but it's so exciting to hear that it's being told in New York and, and there's, you know, there's John Brown sites all around the, all around the country. In fact, I went to, um, the, the abandoned mill site in um, Northwestern PA one time and trudged up to see uh, oh, wow. where his, where his mill was um, out, out in Crawford County, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, let's talk quickly here before we come to a conclusion, what's next for John Brown lives. I mean, obviously all organizations are trying to figure out how to do this thing during the middle of COVID, but, but where, where are you headed? And if people want to learn more, where can they find you? Well, they can go to our website, johnbrownlives.org um, and Facebook. Um, I want to tell you about one project that we have that is, um, it's called Harriet Was Here. 
And it's a project that's a school-based, place-based, arts-infused project that connects, that seeks to connect. We're not always able to do it, but see, seeks to connect kids in northern, southern, and Canadian schools and learning about the life and the remarkable, the mar- remarkable life of uh, service and sacrifice and activism of Harriet Tubman. And the idea is, I mean, she was, she, she has such a footprint, right? that we wanted to um, engage with with children, you know, fourth graders, fifth graders, in places where she either had a foothold in slavery in her childhood, or as she moved through on the Underground Railroad, as she settled with her family in Canada for a while, as she ultimately settled in, in Auburn, New York, and so forth, to get kids learning about Harriet Tubman in their backyard. Who was she here? What brought her here? Why did she move through all of that? And so the kids at this at this young age, you know, at nine, 10, 11 years old, they start to they start to realize, oh, there's history here. There's interesting history here. Oh, I didn't know the place I was born or the place I live was connected to this, you know, kind of amazing women. I think woman, I think in general, um, children learn about Harriet Tubman now, unlike when I was a kid. And there's a lot of admiration. Um, And why we want to, why we seek to involve Northern, Southern, and Canadian schools, in part, is because one of our goals is for children by Skyping and sending friendship packages with kids, let's say in Auburn, New York, with a school on the eastern shore of Maryland, for example. They get to learn from one another about Harriet's life and times in their backyard. And so young students, children, hopefully, uh, you know, begin to appreciate that I might have a, a, a lock on everything Harriet related in my backyard, but I'm not going to really understand or fully appreciate the complexity, the density, the richness of the tapestry of her life or of our country, unless I know what happened someplace else. So that's kind of our goal in in connecting communities and schools. And then the the real heart and soul of that project is that um, the amazing folk duo, Magpie, um, Greg Artsner and Terry Leonino, they come in and they work with the kids over the course of a week to hash out their questions about Harriet, their ideas, what they want to say. And they they end up writing the lyrics to an original song that Greg and Terry put to music and the kids perform it. And they've and they've had, you know, many, um, many ripple effects from that program. So because you're in Maryland, I wanted to I wanted to make a make a plug for um the Harriet Was Here project. We haven't we haven't had a Maryland school involved in quite some time. So if anybody there is listening would like to get involved, please, please contact me. Well that that's a yeah, I was gonna say that's that's a great um sort of plug for that. And what a cool program to connect those dots. And it's it's interesting. I always find it fascinating how many direct connections there are between Maryland and our African American population and abolitionists and everything that's going on here and then New York. Um, and you know, they're, they're coming, coming down and doing things here. And then there are African-Americans moving and going up there. And of course, Frederick Douglass spends a considerable amount of time in upstate New York and uh, around your hometown in Syracuse and Rochester. And, um, it's just, uh, there's, there's some fascinating connections there. And, and I know we, we've previously interviewed Kate Larson about, um, Harriet Tubman and, Obviously, Kate sees those connections as well um, be- between those stories. Nicholas, let me just mention, Kate, you know Kate. She's such a generous, beautiful human being. She Skypes, well, it's now Zoom, but she'll take time to sit in a Zoom session with these kids and answer their questions. So she's, you know, here are these kids. They get the experience to talk with oh, a real historian. She answered my questions. You know, so that's another part of of the Harriet Was Here project that she's just a a gem to work with. The kids love her. Well, I love it. And we'll make sure that um, there's a link to John Brown Lives here in the show notes and over at preservecast.org where the the show show will live in perpetuity. Um, Before we go, um, and I've been, we've been, 
uh, you know, people listening only get the audio of this, but we've got our video turned on, and I see we've I've, we've slowly seen the sunset in the background <laughs> here as as we're recording this. I think I think you guys have been like an extra ten minutes ahead of us. It's gotten darker there quicker, but um, uh, most difficult question we ask most people, particularly people who love history, and we'll let you we'll give you a pass outside of uh, the John Brown Farm uh, and homestead up there in Lake Placid. What is your favorite historic place or site? Oh, you put that in the advanced questions, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I have to pass. No, we've <laughs> never we've never had someone pass. You'd be the first never? in 155 episodes. <laughs> We're not going to let it happen. Oh, my God. The pressure is on. <gasps> oh. oh, my God. Nicholas, you can't do this to me. <laughs> well, you I mean, we we don't have to give you the pass. You could say John Brown Farm. I could say the John Brown Farm. Yeah, it's a very special place. Yeah. It sounds like it. And maybe that maybe that isn't a pass. Maybe uh maybe it just speaks to how important the place is cuz obviously you even said, you know, history wasn't always your thing and this place has changed you. Yeah. Um and maybe there's maybe there's a story in there. Well, this has been a lot of fun to have this conversation to be able to get to hear about the good work that you're doing and and to kind of get a different perspective on Brown. I think a lot of people when we think of Brown, we either think of Kansas or we certainly think of Harper's Ferry. Um but we don't think of, you know, the place he called home and, and, and this evocative place up in the Adirondacks. And uh, I hope when people hit the road again that they get out there and they get a chance to visit you. Thank you. Well, thanks for giving us this, this sort of megaphone. And Absolutely. maybe it'll stitch together, you know, some alliances and program connections with, with you there, Maryland. That would be wonderful. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's show, notes, and all previous episodes, visit PreserveCast.org. You can also find us online at Facebook and Twitter at PreserveCast. This program was supported by the Historic Preservation Education Foundation. PreserveCast is produced by Preservation Maryland in Baltimore City. Thanks again for your support, and remember to keep preserving.